Um, so as Cheryl said, I'm Andrew Harris. I'm one of the cardiologists and echocardiographers here at the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to present today. This is a topic that I really enjoy um, and really enjoy talking about as well. Um, I, I hope that I'm not breaking the rules, but I would like this to be as interactive as possible. I know that it's very challenging to do that over Zoom, but um, I, I encourage you to stop me if there are any questions um, during the presentation. I hope that this is kind of an open forum uh, to discuss what, what I think is, is interesting and hopefully very helpful for people. Um, I, I tried to pick a somewhat narrow scope. Uh, there's really a lot that could be covered. Um, and so if I guessed wrong and you know I haven't talked about what, what is of interest or important to all of you, you know, feel free to ask questions along the way. And, and definitely at the end, we'll try to save some, some time for questions as well. So um, today we'll be discussing the echocardiographic assessment of native aortic stenosis and patients that are post-TAVR. I think I just need to be patient here on the slide advance. There we go. Um, the learning objectives for today are Hopefully by the end, you'll be able to understand the key echo parameters um, in evaluating aortic valve function. And this will be both for native aortic stenosis as well as evaluating patients that have undergone TAVR to assess prosthetic valve function. And hopefully by the end, uh, this will allow people to understand really the, the why of the TVT collection form echo variables. So the outline for my presentation today will be a broad overview of aortic stenosis to get started. And then we'll dive into the echo assessment of native aortic stenosis or AS, um, and then uh, switch over to the echo assessment after TAVR. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with these concepts, but just to start with the basics here. Um, so as you probably all know, Aortic stenosis is really a pressure overload condition of the heart and specifically of the left ventricle that can have other downstream uh, consequences. And um, because of the, uh, can, you, can you all see my arrow here? Yes, we can okay, see it. Perfect. So the most common type of aortic stenosis is degenerative or calcification of the aortic valve. And that leads to restriction of these cusps um, and a limited opening of the aortic valve. And so as a result, the left ventricle has to generate additional pressure to be able to still maintain an adequate cardiac output and blood pressure for the patient. Um, the most direct way of making these measurements of, of the severity of aortic stenosis and, and what was you know, really common early on in the evaluation of aortic stenosis is um, using direct cat, uh, cardiac catheterization um, pressures where the catheters are placed in the left ventricle and aorta, and you can actually look at the pressure gradient in systole um, to see how, how severe the, the blockage is at the level of the aortic valve. So this is a diagram uh, of that. So here we see this is the left ventricular pressure tracing, and here is an aortic pressure tracing. Um, and you see that during systole, because this patient has aortic stenosis, the left ventricle has to generate more pressure um, and the, there's a pressure difference or pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta here. Um, and there are various ways that you can quantify this, but commonly we use the mean or average pressure difference uh, during that period of systole here. And that actually correlates uh, pretty well with the mean pressure gradient that is derived by echo. Um, but as I'll discuss on the next slide, we, we don't directly measure pressure differences. And so the, the concept between how we quantify aortic stenosis with direct catheterization is a little bit different than um, how we do that by echo. So um, this is an analogy that I like to use um, with, with patients as well as uh, with our learners here, um, which is you know, a concept that probably everybody's pretty familiar with. So I, I always talk about the garden hose. So you know, if you're out there on a, a nice summer day in Michigan watering your garden, you're gonna turn the faucet on and the water is gonna be flowing out 
the garden hose at you know a reasonable speed, but not you know not shooting out all over the place. But aortic stenosis is uh, the analogy to that is by covering up the end of the garden hose, and you know if you cover up the the hole or the orifice at the end of the garden hose. Um, significantly, you know, let's say now the, the size of that opening is only 25% of what it had been, to be able to still maintain, there's still the same flow rate of water going through the garden hose, but we'll see that the, the speed of the water really significantly increases and you'll see, you know, the water is shooting out across your garden. And so that that's really the basis by which we make this assessment by echo is that we, we measure the velocity of blood flow with Doppler echo. And that really forms the basis of, of us understanding um, aortic stenosis physiology here. So instead of direct measurements of pressure gradients, we measure velocity. And then we can um, convert that into uh, gradients, making some kind of minor assumptions um, that, that end up being valid and most cases where we can convert a velocity over to a gradient. And we'll come back um, to this analogy, but does that kind of, hopefully that uh, kind of reflects what, what people's um, general uh, knowledge of, of aortic stenosis is. Um, and so here's an example of some of the parameters that we would measure by echo. So on the left side here, is a, a typical Doppler signal of aortic stenosis. And here we're showing the velocity of blood flow during the period of systole um, going through the aortic valve. And from this, we can measure the a very common measurement is the peak velocity. And so this patient has severe aortic stenosis and a peak velocity of 4.2 meters per second. We can then, um, average the velocity over time and convert that to a pressure gradient. And from this, we can um, estimate a mean gradient, uh, which for this patient came out to be 45 millimeters of mercury, which is also consistent with severe AS. Um, so that, that's from just a single Doppler measurement, um, but another very important parameter that becomes uh, essential for understanding aortic stenosis is the aortic valve area. Um, and this is a very useful parameter, but there, it is somewhat subject to error because now we're introducing more measurements um, into this calculation. And whenever you're making multiple measurements in echo, you know, there's always a little bit of error that's introduced. You know, these, are, these are not you know, perfect numbers that, that we're getting and there's some interpretation with, with each measurement. Um, and so just to uh, hopefully not to inundate you with too much math here, but um, the concept is that we can, if we calculate the, the flow rate below the aortic valve, which is accomplished through the area times, this is called the velocity time integral. You can kind of think of that as what is the velocity over time, um, that we can know the flow rate going through the aortic valve, which is the aortic valve area, or in this case, E2 equal uh, times the velocity time integral or the velocity of blood flow going through the aortic valve. So we can measure these three measurements, the area below the aortic valve, the left ventricular outflow tract, the velocity over time below the valve, and we can also measure the velocity going through the aortic valve. So this is an example of how we would make these measurements below, um, so measuring this left ventricular outflow tract diameter, looking at the velocity right below the aortic valve here, and then looking at the velocity going through the aortic valve. And so through the magic of algebra, once we have these three variables that we know, we can then calculate the unknown, which is the one that we really wanna know, which is the aortic valve area. Um, so this equation boils down to aortic valve area equals the LVOT or left ventricular outflow tract area times the velocity in the left ventric ventricular outflow tract over the aortic valve velocity. Um, and so that will give us a measurement in, typically reported in centimeters squared. Um, so these three measurements really form the, the major assessment of how we quantify the severity of aortic stenosis. 
And you know, really what we're oftentimes looking for is whether this patient has severe aortic stenosis or not. Um, and these variables here, or these parameters here are the criteria that we base um, severe AS on. So peak velocity of greater than or equal to four meters per second, mean gradient greater than 40, or an aortic valve area less than 1.0 centimeters squared. So um, let's first kind of start off with a case that, that highlights this. Uh, so this is actually one of my clinic patients that I had been following over time. Um, she's an 81-year-old woman with a history of hypertension who more recently has been having some mild shortness of breath with exertion. She's been known to have this um, systolic murmur and, and really known to have some degree of aortic stenosis. Um, looking at her echo here, uh, we see this is the left ventricle here, and it's, it's squeezing well. The function of the left ventricle is normal. You see that she does have a little bit of hypertrophy of the ventricle, but really focusing on the aortic valve, you see you know, it's very calcified here. Um, it doesn't move very well at all. Um, and then from a short axis perspective and zooming in on the aortic valve, we see that it's really this heavily calcified um, structure that is very restricted in terms of the motion. Then when we um, use Doppler echo um, to quantify this, she had a peak velocity of 4.7 meters per second, mean gradient of 52 millimeters of mercury. And then going through the, the math in terms of the aortic valve area calculation, um, we can plug in these numbers here. Um, the left ventricular outflow tract area is um, estimated by measuring the diameter and converting that into a surface area, assuming that it's a circle, which is an assumption that doesn't necessarily always hold, but we make that assumption. Um, and then we use the, um, the left ventricular outflow tract velocity, uh, the VTI, and divide it by the aortic valve, which I've shown these numbers here. Um, so if we plug in all of these numbers, we get an aortic valve area of 0 0.6 centimeters squared for her. So to summarize her echo parameters, she has a peak velocity of 4.7 meters per second, mean gradient of 52, and an aortic valve area of 0 0.6 centimeters squared. So um, this is where I'm gonna ask people to open mic it. And what, what would you say? Does she have severe aortic stenosis or does she have a, some other severity of aortic stenosis? Okay, Brittany, nice, severe. We'll take it. Uh, so yeah, um, she. this is a case that really never had a whole lot of diagnostic uncertainty about the severity of her aortic stenosis. You know, I, I followed her for a couple of years uh, before she developed symptoms and then we referred her for TAVR and she did really well. But um, she. Um, this is a pretty uh, cut and dry case of severe aortic stenosis here. Okay, let's switch to um, another case that's potentially a little bit more challenging. So this is a 65-year-old man who has a known cardiomyopathy and heart failure due to that, who is presenting to clinic with worsening shortness of breath recently. So we see, sorry, am I, oops. Okay, I'm not sure if that's gonna play. Okay, I'll just describe what, what should be seen here. So this patient actually has severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. His EF is about 25 to 30%. And here you can see, oh, here we go. You can see that he has a calcified aortic valve and it's really not opening normally here. Um, so some restriction of the leaflets. When we look at the Doppler echo assessment, we get a peak velocity of 2.5 meters per second, a mean gradient of 18 millimeters of mercury, and then uh, putting in all of the, the numbers here to calculate an aortic valve area, uh, which is based on the LVOT diameter of 2.2 centimeters that we measure here. We ultimately get an aortic valve area of 0 0.9 centimeters squared. So, this patient has 
peak velocity of 2.5 meters per second, mean gradient of 18 in aortic valve area of 0 0.9 centimeters squared. So what do you think about this patient in terms of does he have severe aortic stenosis or not? Okay, nice. Likely severe, I'm seeing. Okay, yeah. Um, so Melissa, can I just ask you, what are you looking for with the dobutamine? Okay. So yeah, so I didn't want to um, get into the weeds too much. Um, this, this case actually does become a little bit more complex. So um, this, despite the fact that uh, this is where things get a little bit more complex with, with assessing aortic valve disease is when we see this discordance between these low, relatively low gradients, but these valve areas that are consistent with severe aortic stenosis. Um, and so this is potentially consistent with severe AS, um, what becomes very helpful as kind of the next step, sorry, um, is to then look at the stroke volume. Uh, what's the rate of flow going uh, out, of, out of the left ventricle across the aortic valve? Um, and so this is an additional number that can be quite helpful to, to kind of further define um, what the patient's um, physiology is. And so the stroke volume can be calculated really using the numerator of this aortic valve area calculation, where the stroke volume is the LVOT area times the LVOT velocity time integral. Um, we mostly care about the indexed stroke volume so that we can normalize it to the patient's body size. Um, and uh, in this case, putting all the numbers in, we get an index stroke volume of 20.3 uh, mils per meter squared, and that, uh, would be consistent with a low flow state um, because the index stroke volume is less than 35 mils per meter squared. So um, I, I totally agree with the comments of likely severe. Um, you know, this gets a little bit beyond the scope of the presentation today, but um, the hemodynamics could be consistent with severe. There's another thing that I wasn't going to mention today, which is pseudo severe aortic stenosis, which is that the valve would open better if the left ventricle had more squeeze. And so sometimes we will um, perform dobutamine stress echoes uh, for these patients that have low EF, but that's a little bit beyond uh, the scope of what I wanted to cover today. Um, so good, thank you for, for uh, participating with that. So um, the, con the concept of low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis is a little bit more challenging um, to understand and, and maybe all of you already, already um, have this concept down, but I, I'm gonna go back to the garden hose analogy because I think this can be helpful, especially for patients, which is that you know, we in echo, we're looking for the velocity and the mean gradient of flow going out that garden hose or aortic valve. So you're gonna, we're keeping our finger or thumb at the end of the hose and you know, the, the water is really shooting out, but now turn the hose down, the faucet down to, so that water is coming out much more slowly. We have the same orifice size, the same amount of area available to flow through, through the end of the hose. But because the flow rate has decreased, we're also going to see that the velocity of flow and the gradient of flow coming out of the hose um, is less. And so this is exactly what happens in some patients that have a low flow state for various different types of reasons where they can still have a severely stenotic aortic valve, but the velocity and the mean gradient uh, might be um, relatively low um, and that's really because of there's not enough flow to generate that pressure. So um, this kind of boils down to um, there are three different types or flow states um, that are provided in the guidelines that are all considered um, to benefit from aortic valve replacement or intervention. Um, and this is kind of a breakdown of the algorithm 
for how we define which patient is in which type of physiology. Um, so it really typically starts with an aortic valve area less than one centimeter squared to get you going down this path. And then if the peak velocity is high above four meters per second or a mean gradient high above uh, 40 millimeters of mercury, then it's pretty clear cut that this patient has high gradient aortic stenosis. But in those patients that have a small valve area but have a relatively low gradient below these thresholds, we call that um, discordant um, gradients and area or discordant aortic stenosis. And that can be due to um, a low flow, low gradient physiology of aortic stenosis. And looking at the index stroke volume can be very helpful to um, help identify these patients that have this low gradient as a result of the low flow condition. Once we've established that these patients have low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, there's two different flavors of this. The first is what's called classical low flow, low gradient, which is kind of similar to the patient that I, the second case that I discussed of somebody with just a poor pump in terms of there's a lot of um, systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. And so it's not able to generate the flow and pressure um, to be able to see these high gradients. And so that's defined by patients that have an EF of less than 50%. The other flavor is what's considered paradoxical low flow, low gradient, which is patients actually have a preserved ejection fraction, but for various reasons, their stroke volume going through the aortic valve is low. That's usually seen in people that have small hypertrophied left ventricles, um, but it can also be seen in other states such as people that have significant mitral regurgitation where that flow is not going out through the aortic valve. Um, so to summarize the assessment of aortic stenosis by echo, um, echo really plays a major role these days in assessing AS severity. Um, there can be other um, imaging and catheterization um, options to clarify challenging cases, but really the diagnosis is made by echo. Um, and the key echo parameters are peak velocity and mean gradient, which are measured by Doppler echo. And from that, we can derive an aortic valve area. Um, and in select cases, the stroke volume, the index stroke volume can be very helpful for further um, defining the patient's physiology um, and really especially helpful for identifying patients that could have low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. So um, I'm gonna, after this slide, I'm gonna shift over to the assessment of TAVR, um, post-TAVR. So maybe I can pause here and kind of see if anybody has questions about the native AS assessment. Hi, Dr. Harris, this is Brittany. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So you had mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that cardiac cath is a direct review of the mean gradient versus echo, which is indirect. I'm curious if, um, if there is borderline information, if we should be going based off the cath or off the echo. What's your opinion? And great presentation so far. Thanks. Um, so it, um, you know, cardiac catheterization um, can certainly be a helpful modality. You know, there is risk associated with it. So we want to make sure that we're reserving it for these challenging cases where there might be discrepancies between maybe the patient's symptoms and what we're seeing by echo, um, or you know, where we don't really feel like the, the echo data are kind of lining up to tell a consistent story. Um, and you know, it, it, if the cardiac cath, and there's a lot of, you know, this goes way beyond my, um, my level of expertise in the cath lab, there's really a lot of skill that goes into um, making you know, these very detailed measurements um, in the cath lab and, and technique really goes into that a lot. So I think um, you know, if, if done with really good technique and we're getting um, reliable measurements, I do think that you know, cardiac cath um, can, can be kind of the gold standard diagnosis in this case. But um, you know, it, it's, it's a it's not a completely straightforward procedure to get all of these uh, numbers. And again, there's you know, error that's involved in, in even you know, invasive catheterization data. Great, thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> I see a question about is dobutamine stress echo necessary to determine stroke volume, the index stroke volume? Um, so we can, we can measure the index stroke volume um, for any, any echo. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, hopefully that doesn't mess things up too much. Um, so it's actually a pretty simple measurement that we can make. Uh, we don't oftentimes use it because it's not always so clinically relevant, but it really just requires two measurements. And that's for us to estimate the LVOT area here, which um, we measure the diameter, turn that into a radius, and 2 pi r squared is the surface area of a circle. Um, and then all we need to do is measure the, the velocity over time um, below the valve here, um, so that what's called the LVOT VTI. And you multiply those together, and you can get the, the stroke volume. Then divide by the body surface area gives you the index stroke volume. So we can get that um, in a resting state. If we do do dobutamine echo, we can look at the stroke volume with dobutamine and see if the stroke volume augments like we would hope it to, because that's kind of the purpose of, of the test. Um, but that being said, there are certain patients that don't have um, contractile reserve, and you might actually not really see that the stroke volume increases a whole lot with dobutamine. And, and in that case, you're kind of left with this diagnostic uncertainty where the dobutamine test didn't really add a whole lot to your diagnosis of whether this patient had pseudo-severe versus severe AS, um, but it does suggest you know, that patient has a pretty sick left ventricle. I don't know if that answered the question though. Um, other questions before I move on to the TAVR assessment? Okay, great. Okay, well, feel free to pause if, um, if there's any lingering questions that we can circle back at the end as well. So in terms of the goals of, of ECHO for assessing patients um, after getting their TAVR implanted, um, the first is really to determine the procedural outcome and looking at the hemodynamics of, of the prosthetic valve. Um, another aspect which goes beyond the scope of this presentation is we can get quite a bit of information about the placement of the valve, you know, what the structure looks like, uh, but that can be challenging by echo. Um, there's a lot of shadowing that happens with prosthetic valves. And so a lot of the data that we get from echo would be, you know, those data uh, parameters that are in the TVT registry, which are more of the Doppler echo derived numbers. Um, in addition to understanding how, how well we did with TAVR, um, the baseline echo really is uh, essential for identifying uh, how it's functioning right after TAVR when we expect it to be working its best, and to be able to identify changes that occur over time. Um, as people may develop prosthetic valve dysfunction for various reasons. And so this baseline echo that's either happening prior to discharge or the 30-day echo um, really serves as kind of the fingerprint that we can compare uh, subsequent studies to, to, to determine if there are changes um, from that baseline function. Um, and so the VARC-3 criteria, the Valve Academic Research Consortium, um, they've had a, a few different um, types of definitions of, of what we would expect to be a, a successful procedural result by ECHO. Um, and that the most recent version um, is listed here, and that would be a, a TAVR a prosthetic valve that has a mean gradient of less than 20, peak velocity of less than three meters per second. I'm gonna introduce a new, um, uh, parameter here, which is actually not contained within the TVT registry, but I'll mention it here because it is part of the VARC-3 criteria, and that's DVI, which stands for dimensionless valve index. Um, so if that's greater than 0 0.25, um, that would be considered normal. Uh, previous versions of the VARC criteria have focused on aortic valve area, um, which is what is um, it contained within the post-procedural TVT collection forms. And generally, you know, there's a little bit of debate about the threshold for this, but aortic valve area of greater than 1.2 centimeters squared would 
be consistent with more normal prosthetic function. And then um, aortic regurgitation is also a, a very important thing um, that we can identify by echo. And um, the, a successful procedure is considered having less than moderate, so mild or less um, aortic regurgitation. Um, just briefly, since DVI is probably is potentially somewhat of a new concept, and it's a little bit different than what we collect, um, just to kind of show that DVI and aortic valve area are measuring very similar concepts. They're just a slight differences between the two. Um, so the dimensionless valve index is a, is a somewhat simplified um, equation as compared to the aortic valve area. But you see that they're actually very similar. The only difference is that um, the aortic valve area includes the LVOT area. So the, that's the area below the aortic valve. Um, and the reason that this is excluded um, and that the dimensionless valve index can be uh, potentially a more helpful variable, especially in patients with prosthetic valves, is that it can be um, challenging to measure the left ventricular outflow tract diameter, um, especially after TAVR. And so there can be some measurement error that's introduced here, um, but just focusing on the Doppler measurements of the LVOT VTI over the aortic valve VTI or velocity can be used. Um, this, uh, this can be a, a very helpful measurement. And essentially what we're doing is looking at what is the step up in the velocity of, of blood flow as it goes through the aortic valve. So if it steps up by four times or more, that would give you um, a ratio of less than 0.25. And that would be consistent with severe um, native aortic stenosis or severe prosthetic stenosis. Uh, the nice thing is that both of these are flow independent measurements because they they include the left ventricular outflow tract velocities and so we're um, we're kind of normalizing for that um, and as I mentioned it avoids some of the error the DVI avoids some of the error from the LVOT area uh, which is uh, potentially problematic uh, for some patients post haver um, so Brittany is asking ands or ors? So um, I think to answer that, it would typically be that really all of those criteria would be expected to be met. Um, so kind of ands, but I will get into where um, there is some complexity to this, which is why uh, just focusing on a single number can, can be challenging and why it's so helpful to have kind of multiple parameters to assess this. Um, before, and hopefully I'll, I'll answer that question a little bit more, but uh, before jumping into that, I just wanted to kind of briefly mention the clinical significance of some of these variables that we're measuring post-TAVR. So um, elevated gradients and significant paravalvular regurgitation can have uh, pretty significant clinical implications for our patients. Um, so there can be multiple different reasons for people to have elevated gradients, but one of the more common ones is patients that have prosthesis patient mismatch or PPM. Um, and this is this typically manifests as elevated gradients right after the initial um, TAVR implant. Um, and this was, these are data from the original partner trial where we see that um, patients that had no PPM are in this blue line here. And patients that had significant PPM are here. And you see that they, over a period of two years, had significantly increased mortality in those patients with um, significant PPM. And then likewise, uh, paravalvular regurgitation is also associated with mortality. Um, this is from a more recent uh, TAVR trial where they were patients were followed for a year out. Um, and you see that really for less than moderate paravalvular regurgitation, the mortality um, outcomes were very similar, but when patients had moderate or greater paravalvular regurgitation, um, that can have significant clinical consequence um, and associated with higher mortality. Um, and this has been kind of shown time and time again. Um, paravalvular regurgitation has been considered the Achilles heel of TAVR, um, but with newer uh, device development, um, this has really limited 
the, the prevalence of this, but when we see it, it still can be a significant problem for patients. And uh, assessment of paravalvular regurgitation is probably like a topic in and of itself um, and kind of less like how we derive that it becomes a little bit less important in terms of the TVT data collection. Uh, but it, it's, you know, challenging and there can be discrepancies kind of depending on the image quality and things like that. Okay, so hopefully, Brittany, I'll, I'll get back to your question to some extent with this. So this is a echo that I was recently reading. So this is um, a 69-year-old man with a history of severe aortic stenosis who recently underwent a TAVR, and he's um, undergoing his, his um, routine post haver echo on post-op day one. So here you see um, that he has pretty hyperdynamic left ventricular function. So his EF was greater than 75%. Looking at the TAVR valve itself, um, you know, you can see this is kind of a characteristic appearance where we don't necessarily see the leaflet so well because there's shadowing by the metal frame, uh, which echo doesn't really penetrate very well. Um, and, but we see, you know, the valve seems like it's in a pretty expected normal position here, which is good. Um, but he did have higher gradients than you might expect. So his peak velocity was 2.8 meters per second, mean gradient of 21, which would be high. Um, but then when we calculate the numbers, and I'll spare you the equations that I've put on previous slides, he has an aortic valve error of 1.8 centimeters squared and a dimensionless valve index that's, that's nice, that's good at 0 0.57. So what do we make of this? Why does this patient have elevated gradients right after TAVR? Any, any brave souls out there? So I think the question is, which of these data do you believe more, the high gradients or the aortic valve area and DVI? And so this is actually a case of, sorry, wait for it. There we go. Uh, so this is a case of somebody who actually has normal prosthetic valve function, but hyperdynamic left ventricular function. And kind of the, this is the opposite of that low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis concept. This patient had high flow going through the aortic valve and he had a normal valve, but uh, because of the high flow, the, the measured gradients are gonna be high. So this is, you know, to your question, Brittany, which of these numbers do you focus on? And is it, you know, all of them have to be at goal? You know, for me, seeing this patient clinically, I'm not worried about this valve function. He's, he, we expect that he's going to do great after his TAVR because the valve itself is working well. It's just that we know that prosthetic valves can never completely re recapitulate a normal human aortic valve. And so when flow is increasing, we might expect, you know, somewhat higher gradients to result even with a normal um, TAVR valve. Um, and so this kind of gets into the concept of elevated gradients post TAVR, which is something that we see frequently in the echo lab, um, something that I, I think is you know, really kind of an interesting um, differential diagnosis to work through when we're seeing patients clinically. Um, and, and really, this is where knowledge of the baseline echo and seeing how uh, things evolve over time can be very, very helpful. Um, so starting on the left here, patients with prosthesis patient mismatch or PPM, these are patients that are going to have elevated gradients from the initial post haver echo. Um, it's usually seen in patients that have a relatively small valve implanted, and in this case, the aortic valve area would be usually less than 1.2 centimeters squared. For the case that I just presented of somebody with a hyperdynamic left ventricular um, performance, um, or we can also see this in patients that have significant aortic regurgitation that leads to greater forward flow as well. And so you can see elevated gradients, but 
uh, because there's no stenosis at the level of the aortic valve, we'd expect there to be a relatively normal aortic valve area that's calculated. Then for these other conditions um, that lead to prosthetic stenosis, um, these are conditions that can present later. And so you might have somebody that has normal valve function, but we're seeing that on a subsequent echo, their gradients are higher than, than they were previously. And to be able to sort out um, you know, what, which etiology of these three or others is actually going on um, does take you know, further clinical context to sort that out and potentially further imaging. Um, but again, because the level of uh, the reason for the elevated gradients is due to stenosis at the level of the valve, we would expect the aortic valve area to be um, low, so less than 1.2 centimeters squared. Okay, and so just to kind of finish up with um, our last case here. So um, this is a patient that was referred to us because she had elevated gradients uh, that were seen in follow-up after undergoing a previous TAVR. So she's an 87-year-old woman, history of aortic stenosis treated with TAVR six years prior, who is now presenting with worsening shortness of breath. Her post-TAVR echo um, showed beautiful results with a peak velocity of 1.4 meters per second, mean gradient of nine millimeters of mercury, and an aortic valve area of 2.3 centimeters squared. Shown here, we see on her echo, she has normal left ventricular function, uh, but we do see quite high gradients here. So we get a peak velocity of 4.5 meters per second, mean gradient of 50, um, and you know, doing the numbers, we get an aortic valve area of 0.6 centimeters squared, and a low DVI of 0 0.2, um, 0 0.20. So what do we make of this? What's, what's going on with um, this valve right now? Okay, any thoughts? This is nearly the last slide. So put your nickels down. Okay, uh, so let me advance here. So this is a patient that now has severe prosthetic stenosis. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so this is somebody who had severe prosthetic stenosis. And really when we look back at, I didn't give you this information, but when you look back, her gradients have been slowly increasing over time. Um, and so that really supports the diagnosis of structural valve degeneration, as opposed to other conditions that can present more acutely, such as valve thrombosis or endocarditis or other things. So it is a little bit early, but there can be variability in terms of how quickly these um, valves uh, fail from uh, structural valve degeneration. Okay, so to summarize the post-TAVR echo assessment, um, a detailed echo assessment is really essential for determining the procedural outcome. And I, I hope that I've um, shown you that really multiple parameters are necessary to accurately characterize prosthetic valve function. There's not a single um, value that can give you the whole picture. And so really we, we focus on multiple parameters and try to you know, fit together the, the picture to really tell, it, tell a convincing story by echo. Um, serial echoes are really essential for determining um, new valve function or dysfunction that develops. And the comparison to the baseline post-TAVR echo, I can't overstress how helpful that can be in determining whether there's been a significant change in prosthetic valve function. And so to um, conclude the presentation, um, so ECHO, hopefully I've, you're probably already aware of this, but hopefully I've convinced um, everyone that ECHO is really key for identifying patients that will benefit from TAVR uh, for the treatment of severe aortic stenosis. Um, it plays an essential role in determining TAVR valve function and really that multiple parameters are necessary to accurately assess aortic valve function with peak velocity, mean gradient, aortic valve area, and stroke 
index stroke volume uh, being some of the really key um, parameters that can help us to make accurate diagnoses. Um, so with that, let me um, open it up for further questions. So thank you. Um, let's see if we have a uh, very informative and welcome. So um, this is really good, very thorough. I really, we really enjoyed it. Um, do you see something on the echo post implant um, that would lead you to think that this patient is going to be readmit readmitted? Like, is there any association you can come up with? Like, um, we also look at readmissions and mm -hmm. wondering if there's something, I mean, obviously moderate regurge, but anything other than that, that you can say, hmm, this might be an issue? Um, I think, you know, for like a 30 day readmission, it, it's probably going to be something that's fairly dramatic on echo. Um, and so, you know, we do look for appropriate valve implantation, even valves that were beautifully implanted in the cath lab, we know that there can be migration of TAVR valves. So, you know, we've seen the very next day, wow, that valve is now deep down into the left ventricular outflow tract, might be impinging the anterior mitral valve leaflet, might now have new aortic regurgitation. So, you know, some of those more dramatic findings, you might say, oh yeah, this, this patient, you know, might, might not do so well in the short term. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, really significant uh, paravalvular regurgitation or you know, really severely elevated gradients, um, probably, you know, if you look at a lot of patients uh, would, would be associated with 30 day outcomes. And then over kind of the longer term, um, you know, patients with PPM, you know, have, you know, moderately elevated gradients. Those are those patients are not necessarily getting readmitted within 30 days, but you know they might have um, less benefit in terms of resolution of symptoms and you know other um, uh, other kind of parameters of how well they do post haver. So, what role do you play as part of the multidisciplinary team in these PPM discussions for patients who can only have a small valve? Yeah, I, I'll be honest that a lot of that discussion, you know, I kind of view myself as, as kind of the diagnostician um, of saying, yes, I, I do think that this patient has severe aortic stenosis. Um, and, and then, you know, oftentimes we'll refer them to my interventional cardiology and surgical colleagues. And, and really then at that point, they are coming up with the solution of, well, th this patient has a small annulus what are what are our options for how to how to deal with that and you know some of it depends on how high risk the patient is how old they are you know whether they're going to need further aortic valve interventions in their lifetime um, but i think that become that's really you know a very interesting um, uh, aspect that i'm not so directly involved in but you know we here we have you know if, a few really great surgeons that are very much um, in, you know, part of the team that's making these decisions of, well, should we enlarge the annulus up front so that they could then get a valve and valve taver, you know, 10, 15 years down the line? Or do we kind of tolerate that, yes, this patient might have a slightly elevated gradient, but, you know, they, their life expectancy is not, you know, 10, 15 years, maybe we can tolerate that. So, so does anyone else have any questions before I go ahead and ask another one? <laughs> um, please feel free to speak up. So as I look, um, we used to um, abstract aortic stenosis post TAVR as a yes, no question. And as I look at all the records around the state, because that's part of what I do is I go in and um, do a chart review of all the TAVR procedures in every site of the state. Um, it seems that some sites will say that um, there is aortic stenosis post-procedure. Um, I'm wondering if that means that maybe um, 
and, and maybe they do it regularly. I would say, is there like some training or different way to read like a post taver echo that even if the valve area is one, um, is that necessarily definitely aortic stenosis post taver and kind of works into their success, you know, overall success rate through TVT? I see. Yeah. Are you are you thinking that people might be kind of downplaying their success because they're they're calling stenosis when there might not be? No, I think um, I, I guess I'm wondering is there like special like echo training or something that they should look at aortic valves post taver differently for like success? Like, is this aortic stenosis post post a taver? you know, right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's a lot that kind of goes into the assessment that cannot be completely boiled down to these, you know, four parameters that I've suggested, but they, they tell, you know, a, a big part of the story. And, um, you know, I think part of the reason to go away from the, the calculated aortic valve area and shift more toward the dimensionless valve index is because so frequently one of, you know, the only thing that's kind of speaking in favor of this being stenosis is you have a small valve area, but, you know, the measured gradients look fine, um, the velocity is low, and we've just kind of made some mistake with the left ventricular outflow track tracing, which is really, you know, quite common. We, we can't always see it so well. We know that it's underestimated by echo as compared to CT. Um, and so kind of moving away from that might be helpful to kind of clarify when the elevated gradients are due to the valve itself versus, um, you know, other reasons for having elevated gradients. And then, you know, once you've excluded some, some things like hyperdynamic left ventricular function, significant aortic regurgitation, then, you know, oftentimes you're left with PPM as being kind of the most likely reason that somebody has an elevated gradient immediately after TAVR, because a lot of these other types of valve dysfunction really occur later on um, down, down the road, not, not in the immediate period. Yeah. Okay, that, make, that makes good sense. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, well, I guess I was using up all the question time. But I want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Harris. We are, um, this is very good, very good presentation, very good overview, and gives us a much better understanding of what our patients look like ahead and after. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.